We are very excited to welcome Dr. Julia Baird tonight. Uh, Dr. Baird is an Australian journalist, broadcaster, and author, and tonight she will be discussing her new book, Victoria the Queen. This biography of one of the world's most famous monarchs draws on previously unpublished personal documents to present a comprehensive narrative of Queen Victoria's life, from her birth in 1819, when she was fifth in line to the throne, through her eventual accession at the age of 18 and her 63-year reign as the Queen of the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Baird offers an engaging portrait of a woman who reigned over an empire at a time when European women typically did not possess much in the way of political or economic power. But as well as being a monarch, Victoria was also a human being. She was complex and flawed, and she faced many of the same personal struggles that we do today. The author John Meacham described this book best when he wrote that, quote, in Baird's hands, Victoria's story resonates in our own time, shedding new light on why we live the way we do now. So without further ado, please join me in welcome, ju welcoming Julia Baird to Politics and Prose. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming here this evening on a rainy night. I, I know that Politics and Prose is quite an institution and I'm very honored to be asked here. So thank you so much for coming. Now tonight I wanted to talk to you about the idea of Victoria's Secrets. <laughs> yeah, right. Not Heidi Klum. She's not about to burst out of this, uh, the, the next room in some kind of Trump-esque fantasy. Um, but about Victoria, um, whom, by the way, Victoria's underwear is constantly on sale at some auction house somewhere around the world. I cannot fathom it. I don't know how someone managed to get what seems to be a vast... Um, you know, collection of these bloomers. And I'm a little bit suspect about it. Actually, I need to investigate whether they are indeed Victoria's large underpants that seem to be bought around the world at any given time. But anyway, Victoria's Secrets. And by the way, one of my favourite things about Victoria is her complete absence of vanity. She ditched corsets because she was a queen. She didn't have to. She liked surrounding herself with beautiful people but didn't fuss so much about her own. And but when she, she did have moments of anxiety and someone actually came up to me today and said that they liked it. The, on the back here, Stacey Schiff says um, she likes it. Vic, she said, Stacey wrote, Victoria was young enough when she assumed the throne to consult with her prime minister about her eyebrows. Were they too thin? And, but what she also did, and this was just before her wedding, and she was so anxious about her wedding because she'd had such a fantastic couple of years being a single queen, being able to do what she want, having balls, um, spending hours and hours riding with her prime minister. Um, she was worried about giving that up and giving up her autonomy. She didn't know much about what it meant, especially the consummation of marriage. She would not have been given very much good information at all, I suspect. And in going to Lord Melbourne and saying, oh, I'm worried about all these things. And I, by the way, I've kind of lost weight, then a bad thing. Um, basically was fishing for physically, am I going to be okay as a bride? And he said to her, reassuringly, Victoria, you have a very firm and anxious nostril. And this to him was the best thing he could say to the Queen, going to show how, um, how standards of beauty can change over the years. But it's quite a sweet way this Prime Minister was try trying to assure his charge, who was the Queen who's often cast and misunderstood because of the way she's been portrayed and the way she has physically been cast in statues. In 1919, the editors of the Arts Gazette decided to ask readers to nominate the ugliest statue in London. Now, George Bernard Shaw weighed in on this. Now, he stressed that he admired Victoria's determination and panache, but he thought there were a number of statues of her that might qualify. He wondered what crime Queen Victoria committed that she should be so horribly guided as she has through the length and breadth of her dominions. It was part of her personal quality that she was a tiny woman, barely five foot tall. And our national passion for telling lies in every public subject has led to her being represented as an overgrown monster. He continued, while Victoria was a little woman with great decision of manner and a beautiful speaking voice, which she used in public extremely well, 
and she carried herself very well, he lamented, all young people now believe that she was a huge heap of a woman. All young people and older people also believe a bunch of things about Victoria that are not true as well. Now, the task of the historian is much like that of the archaeologist, except what we're chipping through is myth instead of rock. What we're dusting off is assumptions and errors. At first, I thought my greatest responsibility as a biographer was to expose how the many fictions about Victoria have clouded our understanding of her. I did not expect to be, 115 years after she died, still thwarted in this task, still censored and perplexed by the secrecy of the Royal Archives entrusted with preserving the memory and, as it turns out, the respectability of the Queen. For in truth, the history of the Royal Family is a history of bonfires, vast piles of letters, Precious correspondence piled in mounds in courtyards and set alight, thrown into fireplaces. The evidence of the secret whisperings, the shameful liaisons, the deep prejudices, the embarrassing alliances. Evidence which for many of us would consider to be of being human. I spent the better part of last year, of this year, sorry, consulting lawyers with how best to tell and preserve and still be able to tell this story while simultaneously marvelling at how this managed to escape the flames still. The irony is Victoria wasn't just a great communicator and she wrote millions of words over her lifetime. Conservative estimate is that she wrote about two and a half thousand words a day when she was queen, which is about 60 million words, um, a challenge for any biographer. But she was also a great preserver of her correspondence and of others. But now so much of what she's done has been tampered with. A researcher needs to spend almost as much time pondering what is not there as what is there, like holding, trying to read invisible ink by holding a page over a flame without it setting on fire, of course. Now, oddly enough, I began thinking about Queen Victoria in the aftermath of the 2008 presidential campaign. I was living here, working at Newsweek in New York, and we were having many debates about women and power. I'd written a PhD about the way we think about powerful women. I was reporting for Newsweek on Sarah Palin, on Hillary Clinton, um, by the way, um, and one of, the, one of the, the threads of these arguments is our seeming inability to reconcile women and power. How often it seems a troubling pairing, a surprising pairing, a, a bizarre or unnatural one. And I do think Victoria would be classified in almost any sense as a nasty woman if we're to take that to someone who's in the public domain and is fairly forthright and robust. William Gladstone said of her... Being alone in a room with the Queen is enough to kill any man. (laughs) And Otto von Bismarck walked out of a room of a meeting with her, mopping his brow and saying, my God, what a woman. I could do business with her. The highest of the highest of compliments. She was also, by the way, the subject of more assassination attempts than any of the other men. She was shot at eight times by seven men most of whom were sent to Australia eventually, Um, and actually had quite um, interesting careers there from selling pies in Perth to to becoming an artist in Melbourne. And she also – and she was – clobbered over the head with a club, um, turning up at the opera with a, with a black eye. She refused to stop appearing in public. She continued to ride in her open carriage. Some of the men who tried to attack her said that they just didn't think a woman should be leading the United Kingdom, should be leading Great Britain. And, um, and some of the female writers at the time said, what is it about a queen that incites such violence? While I was thinking about these these women. Um, My editor, John Meacham, suggested that Queen Victoria had not been examined for some time. I went to the New York Society Library, one of my favourite libraries, um, and read everything I could. And I was really staggered by the unvarying repetition of the same views about Victoria, really very rare, fresh interrogation of new material. And the myths that were repeated, under which I believe a funny, sprightly, very passionate and robust mother and woman had been buried, were created by observers, by sycophants, by monarchists, by republicans, 
by the Queen herself and bolstered by the royal family ever since. These myths are, include, when Albert died, she died too, that she was an impeccably behaved constitutional queen, that she was a simple product of the men who advised and shaped her like a walking, talking Galatia, and of course that her servant John Brown was just a good friend, a myth that she only ruled with the help of her husband, that she believed women had no place in the public sphere, that she was a bad and cruel mother, a domestic tyrant, as one series on the BBC called her recently. I honestly think they missed two decades of her diaries. That she was a severe, stout, that both of those things were partly true, but there was much more, and humorless woman, perennially unamused, who mourned without effectively ruling for decades. There are other myths, by the way, that she smoked cannabis to relieve cramps. That is not the case. I did look into that. Um... And she is always associated with Victorian Puritanism, which is something, in fact, her husband championed. Uh, When her doctor advised her that she could have no more children at the age of 38, there was really time after nine, she should probably consider it done. She complained that she she, she might not have any more fun in bed. One thing I really noticed, I don't know if any, any of you here have been to the Isle of Wight, Yes, and you went to Osborne House, which is fantastic. It is so incredibly preserved from the the time that Victoria died. So you walk in there, this house, their first private residence, this house they'd set up together, and you can see the evidence of a young family there, of the plaster casts of small hands and feet of the children. And, And Albert, of course, designed the gardens and the blinds and the nursery and the sanitation system and... He was quite an extraordinary thinker and he would spend their holidays out digging ditches to experiment with sanitation. There was a painting in the drawing room there. It was on my second or third time that I went and the guide sidled up to me and said, oh, you might want to take a closer look at that painting. Often the the artist leaves a little trick in the painting. I was like, okay. And it's of a picnic on a sunny afternoon. These three women sitting around and one of them's holding up a parasol and one of them is leaning back on on the two two other women with this kind of blissful look on her face, a lovely summer afternoon. If you look closely at it, suddenly you'll notice there's another pair of feet coming out from the woman's skirt. And if you look more closely still, there you can see the shape of the ba- of a back of a man's back, also under this woman's skirt. That is one of the first things p- paintings that Victoria bought, which gives you some insight into who Victoria really was, as compared to the way that we think of her now. And I had not seen that written about I- anywhere else. So since I began this project. I've st- I dug through material from archives in London, in Scotland, Oxford, Sydney, Germany, America, to find out who she was. The wonderful process of poring over dusty documents and deciphering terrible handwriting um, and even hieroglyphics and special codes that some families had written in, in journals in Oxford. I walked slowly and repeatedly through the rooms at Osborne House, Windsor Castle, Buckingham Palace and Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Um, Balmoral, by the way, is revealing not most of all for its tartan furnishings. It was the entire thing plastered with tartan. Again, I don't know if anyone's been there. They called it tartanitis or something. She was not known for her interior decorating sense. Um, But... uh, but it's it's what strikes you there is its remoteness. I think we're all used to seeing photos of the of the mannered royals in their kilts posing for photographs, but actually, um, it's still quite wild to this day. And you can understand how much of a respite it would have been for a, a queen who was never comfortable with the aristocracy and who craved simplicity and who craved Balmoral because she used to like to go there and just weave weave in and out of the the cottages nearby and plonk herself down by the fire. In all of this exp- exploration, I found that Victoria grappled with many of the things we do today. 
Managing uneven relationships, placating resentful spouses, trying to raise decent children, battling bouts of insecurity and depression, spending years recovering from childbirth, yearning for loves that are lost and then found again, and longing to make the decisions about your life and shape the world we live in. I was really surprised by her wicked and often slapstick sense of humour, her complete dislike of pretension, her candour, her tolerance of different religions, in particular Islam, um, which is interesting and which is not spoken about very much, her intense and her enduring involvement in politics, ordering around prime ministers, trying to keep Lord Melbourne in power and trying to keep Lord Gladstone out of power. Um, and directly corresponding with generals in the field. She wrote annual letters to the, to the elephant man who'd captured her imagination. And when she found out that the tallest man in the world was marrying the tallest woman in the world, she was so excited. She invited them to Buckingham Palace and she was here and they were up here and she, she gave them a wedding dress. Um, she was so excited. The people she took an interest in, and in particular animals, actually. I found that Victoria adored her husband completely. That is something that is true, their endearing um, nature of their love. But it was also a complicated relationship. Her belief that he was superior in every way had undermined her self-esteem so much by the time that he died, she was almost entirely lacking in self-confidence and very, very anxious about public appearances, about eyes upon her. For those who've been watching The Crown, this is an enduring theme. How to manage being the spouse of a queen, um, by, especially in a time when women weren't supposed to rule. And Albert was from a place where women were not supposed to rule, from Coburg. I also found, oh, by the way, <laughs> um, one of the, the greatest insights into their rela the relationship between Victoria and Albert um, is in, is in the archives, which were supposed to have been destroyed. And there were letters between the chief librarians about how Beatrice, Victoria's youngest daughter, wanted this correspondence that she discovered was still there, burnt. So the librarians said, sorry, she'd never have shown it to her. Okay, the king says, send it to her, she can burn them, off to another bonfire. But someone took a photograph of these documents and I don't know why, whether it was a librarian or an archivist with a rebellious heart, um, whether in fact the king allowed it. But there they are, these photographs and tied neatly in this little box. And the photos are of the memoranda they sent to each other when they fought. When they fought, they would retire to their rooms and write these notes and communicate through a secretary, sometimes for several days. And it's fascinating. Um, you can, uh, uh, Albert, there's very much this cool rational German and Victoria who since she was a toddler had been having tantrums they called combustibles um, and he was extremely passionate and you can see these notes where he's like number one you must control yourself <laughs> <laughs> number two um, I think um, you should stop following me from room to room when we argue <laughs> Number three, I really think you would benefit if you applied logic to your thinking. Um, and I think really she probably just needed to vent. But it's, it's a great insight into um, the passions of a, of a young couple. I also found out that she loved her Highland ser servant, John Brown. Now, this is one of the most speculated on, gossiped about relationships in history. She deeply, truly loved him to the extent that she guiltily consulted a priest when she started missing Albert a little less. And he said it was okay. She called him her best friend. When he died, she was bereft for the second time in her life. She really did speak about the relationship like it was the second major of her life. She likened his loss to the loss of Albert. And a lot of people talk um, often cite Tennyson saying, of Victoria, she was all alone on that terrible height. But he didn't say that after the, the death of Albert. He said that after the death of John Brown. He lived on the Isle of Wight with her, Tennyson. In my quest to find out what the true nature of the, uh, this relationship was, he, he was a giant of a man, by the way, in his six foot something, 
He called her woman. Now, his familiarity, of course, was, was scandalous at the time. But we must also remember that this is a woman who, when Albert died, said, who will call me Victoria now? And John Brown went that extra bit further and called her woman, who te- teased her about her weight, and she loved it. He drank and he swore and he devoted his life to the Queen. The rest of the family weren't so happy and called him the Queen's stallion. But in trying to find out, I ended up in a large stone home in a village called Lantern in the Scottish Lowlands. Here there are meticulous records of a doctor, Dr James Reid, and who served the Queen for the last two decades of her life. She died in his arms, his arm and that of the Kaiser who would be at war with England. Um, 14 years later. There are his newspaper clippings and his funeral services um, and most importantly, his diary. Now, I read his account of Victoria's death and was incredibly moved. His grief was so palpable. I read his report of what happened to the Queen's body after having having children and a ventral hernia, something he only discovered after he examined her for the first time properly after her death. I also found that this doctor had taken a particular and careful interest in her relationship with Brown. Now, there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, doubtless, this is due to the fact that he was later entrusted by Edward VII, Victoria's eldest son, to purchase some letters. The letters, Reid wrote, were most compromising. They were from Victoria to the manager of the Balmoral estate about Brown. There were 300 of them. They were bought for a considerable sum, another bonfire. But we do have, we do have Reed's record of his, of his describing that they, were, that they were compromising. So the manager's son had blackmailed the king. Reed had been in, involved in this. Part of this was due to things he had witnessed, to exchanges between the pair. He kept this tiny little diary and he'd write in it, rode on my bike to see my wife. Uh, you know, went down to the local village, picked up something for the Queen who was feeling poorly, didn't sleep well. On one of the pages in very tiny little script, almost in code, it's abbreviated, he recorded unusually something that he walked in on. And, 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 and this had never been published before, I think for fear of scandalising the royals. And as I tell you this, you must keep in mind this is a strange story and interpret it as you will. He opens the door to Victoria's room on Thursday the 22nd of March 1883 and he sees her standing with Brown and Brown lifts up his kilt and says to her, oh, I thought it was here. And Victoria responds laughing and says, no, 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 it's here and she lifts up her skirt. Now, that's it. The doctor was... um, of sufficiently intrigued by this to note it down. And what it is, of course, we do not know. What we do know is that it shows an incredible intimacy between a monarch and her servant and also between an, a man and a woman at that time. The, the Scottish, of course, have been absolutely thrilled with this discovery <laughs> to have a Scotsman lifting up his kilt in the presence of the Queen And the headline in The Scotsman was, Biographer Reveals, John Brown and Queen Victoria Expose Themselves to Each Other, which was not my intent. We really don't know and you can take from it what you think. But um, part of St James' interest in John Brown as well was the fact that he he was the one that the Queen entrusted with her deepest secrets and that is what she would be buried with, what she would take with her to the grave. And this is why I ended up in Scotland. I was trying to find the handwritten instructions she had for her dresser, uh, for for Dr. Reid on the time of her death, to be kept in the pocket of her dresser at all times. And it was very, very specific. This is in the this is in the doctor's archives. Somehow managed to not be in the royal archives. So in this, she included a long list of objects she wanted placed in. Mementos from her children, photographs of her grandchildren. On her hands, she wanted rings from Albert um, and her sister and her mother. In this hand, 
She had Albert's photograph and his lock of hair. In this hand, John Brown's photograph and a lock of his hair and his mother's wedding ring to be put on her finger. Then this was to be wrapped in gauze and have flowers placed over it so that her family would never see what was curled up in her palm at the time of her death. Um, and it, it should be no. Oh, and she also had. Um, she wanted both of their both of their handkerchiefs to be put upon her. Her actual words: "I want a plain gold wedding ring, which had belonged to the mother of my dear J Brown, was given him by her in '75, which I which I have worn constantly since his death, to be on my fingers." In addition to all these, I should wish the pocket handkerchief of my dearest husband and one of his cloaks a shawl worked by my dearest daughter Alice, and a pocket handkerchief of my faithful Brown, who was more devoted to me than anyone, to be laid on me. Of course, the royal family soon, they, on, on, on the time of Victoria's death, all of her, her letters with John Brown were destroyed. The memoirs she tried to write about him were also destroyed. Um, so it's incredible that this is still intact and it's really kind of quite a beautiful relationship that had provided much consolation to the horror of her family. So in all of my, tra in my travels, I was discovering a lot of interesting things, but what the, the greatest hurdle for me was gaining access to the Royal Archives. I couldn't get in. I sent three requests. In a way, I guess I was naive. I had thought I have a PhD in history and I have a contract to write a major biography and I will treat the material in a really scholarly and careful way. But I was rebuffed. Um, it's not transparent about who gets selected and why. And they said, you haven't written a royal history. It's your first biography. Now, I must add to that that only just recently I, I was talking in Sydney and someone came up to me who writes stories for a women's magazine there that always runs stories on the royals who said to me, oh, I loved being at the archives. It was fantastic. Um, we, with no disrespect meant to the world of women's magazines, it, it um, is entirely inconsistent who gets in and how and why. I kept trying and it was in, in mid-2013 that I happened to mention actually by accident um, to um, a man who was then the official secretary of Australia's Governor General, so the Queen's representative in Australia, who happened to be our first female Governor General. And she lobbied on my behalf and vouched for my character. And eventually I was able to get in and I was so thrilled to actually feel the parchment in my hands and to see the ink of her handwriting and to find things like the, the memoranda between Victoria and Albert. It's in the um, round tower of the Windsor Castle, if anyone's ever been there. Um, and you go up a hundred stairs, you're advised to dress in a certain way. I had to wear appropriate shoes. I didn't know what that meant. Um, I wore heels and that was stupid because it's cobblestone. Um, and it took me a long while to get up there. You go up a hundred stairs and then you're taken up to this tiny room. Now, you have to be escorted at all times in the round tower for fear that, so people don't, you know, take off with, with vital documents. But it does mean that you are escorted every time you go to the bathroom, um, which can be awkward because if there's one archivist who sits next to you and if there's someone else in the room, they can't take you. So there's a little pressing of an intercom which goes around the round tower. It's like, um, Dr. Baird would like to use the bathroom. <laughs> Again. Um, <laughs> echoing in the castle walls so anyway I stopped drinking really for a while then but I was I, I found some great material in there um, and was thrilled about it what happens when you then work at the archives is you sign a contract and you say that you will show them all material that all of the parts of your book which rely on their material um, for them to give consent to um, and to check. 
to make sure you've given the correct references. I have to say I have enormous admiration for their fastidiousness, their attention to detail and how scrupulous they are. There are many baffling things about it. There is, for example, no catalogue at all. You have to guess what's there. Um, I was told we can generally get some of what you're saying, but there's other things that would take me such a long time to get and they're buried all over the place. Um, so there's a nagging feeling um, of frustration when, when you're there, uh, wonderful as it is. Some boxes are entirely closed. For example, um, Victoria's daughter Louise, the beautiful sculptor who um, married a man who preferred male company and she had lovers of her own. She's said to have been with this famous sculptor, Edward Bohm, when he died. Um, and that box is simply closed. Now, um, the some have valiantly still attempted to write biographies, um, which I take my hat off to. And I guess, and the assuring thing is this doc ev evidence still remains intact. Now, I sent them my full manuscript and... And several months later, got back some really interesting feedback, um, some tiny corrections to things, which I was very grateful for, um, and also some suggestions that I, it's a, a request that I remove all material to do with John Brown, <laughs> the way she was buried, uh, Dr. Reed's correspondence. Um, so that was an interesting few months. Um, and I guess it's, it's a fascinating point when, when, again, we're watching the crown and again, we're grappling with the role, role of the monarchy, how, how vested the monarchy remains in the reputation of monarchs past as well as present. And there's a, there's a lot of, um, impetus in the UK at the moment, um, asking for more open access of this, uh, of the of these incredibly precious documents. Like I remain convinced of the view that letting daylight in upon magic, as Walter Badgett said, does not, in, does not destroy an enchantment with the monarchy, merely allows us to more fully understand some of the more remarkable and curious royal characters in our history, including that of one of the world's most powerful and fascinating women. I would argue the case for a more informed kind of enchantment, one rooted more in rigorous research and accuracy, truth, than spells, mystery and intrigue, in openness and transparency rather than censorship presented as privacy. Today we're grappling with the question of women and power. We have been for a long time, we'll continue to. How do we view those in the public domain? What do we bring to it that might distort our perceptions? What of those women who we thought we understood from history but actually have been buried in plain view and why and how does that happen? And those questions to me remain vitally important questions, whether you've inherited power or whether you've won it, um, whether you've fought for it. Because Victoria too had to fight for her own power. It was not just a crown thrown, it was not just a crown placed on her head. Her mother, her mother's advisor, tried to get her to sign it away to them when she was just a teenager. There were various enroachments on it throughout her life and she always fought for her um, for her right to be consulted, um, to heed, to encourage, to warn. To me, this is the great enterprise of history. And um, I wonder if Victoria still has more secrets. I hope I've, I've, I've uncovered as many as I can. Thank you. All right. So, um, yes, so if anyone has any questions, if you can go to the microphones there. So two related ones. Mm. If uh, she was so concerned about maintaining her, getting the power and hanging on to it, mm -hmm. what did she want to do with it? Mm -hmm. um, and did she think about Queen Elizabeth at all? I mean, Queen Elizabeth was as, as important a figure in English history and a queen, maybe one of the most important queens um, of all time, mm. uh, at a time when women had no power at all. Right, right. Yes, no, I thought really about one queen at a time, but she does pop up perennially through this as a foil because Victoria was the domestic queen, the you know, nine children defined in many ways by her relationships. Um, sorry, your first question was? She wanted power. What did she want to do with it? She had a, a, an intent 
to she did not approve of a foreign like of an interventionist foreign policy. She was intent on the expansion of empire. She was very strong minded about the need to conduct wars correctly. The seeing the the soldiers return from the Crimea, a horrific war, an incredibly poorly executed war, a great embarrassment, no matter how many noble poems have been written about it. Um, when she saw those soldiers return without their limbs, with all their scars, and despite all the spin, she was constantly given by generals. She always wanted to make sure that there were enough. And actually, in the Boer War too, she was very concerned about the horses. She was very interested in the animals. But she wanted um, action to be taken um, to, to make sure it was a properly resourced military. Um, yeah, she was involved in, in very many different things in her time. She, she and Albert both had the view that there should be a strong Prussia to lead a united Germany. Um, some Ooh. people say that the uh, First World War would not have happened her influence I'm not sure we could be so we could be so correct um that's that's part of an answer to to Thank your you. question thanks yes uh, what would Queen Victoria think of the British exit <laughs> one and since you covered Sarah Paulin mm. how do they compare <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, well, Sarah Palin's never really been in a position of power as such. Um, how do they compare? I'm just trying to, th I'm just seeing it immediately. I think of the stereotypes and the pit, pit bull and in lipstick. Um, Sarah Palin is very comfortable with a, with a spotlight and very comfortable with, with um, being a public face Victoria really resiled from it. She was interested in, in operating behind the scenes. She hated being stared at. She, she, to an extent that, to be honest, sometimes was ridiculous. She just refused to open parliament. She really was very reclusive. Um, she was, she had no time for anything kind of fancy or distracting. She was the monarch who was in a bonnet and she very much wanted to. What they do have in common is, is a desire to intuit what, however you might determine the ordinary voter to think, to, you know, to think and to feel. And, and it, Victoria had an uncanny knack of divining what it was her subjects would, would have wanted. And her ministers often commented on that. So, and again, now your first question, Sarah, oh, Brexit. <laughs> She was, pri she was primarily a nationalist. She had great suspicion of the French. She would not have liked the bureaucracy. Um, and and I, I think that if she, she would have economically wanted it to be a strong power, I think she actually would have been quite t torn about it, but ultimately would have had faith in the you know, British people's impact to, I mean, you know, ability to... Um, contain their identity, whether, the, whether they can then harken back to the period that's often spoken about. Nationalism's taken such a different form under this election with respect to, um, with respect to Brexit. And it, again, it depends which economists you believe and which pundits you believe. Um, but I do think that she definitely would have been, um, had, had great insights into the frustrations that many people felt and the freedom in which they felt to, to vote for that. I'm completely speculating on that and I'm going to have to ponder it further. <laughs> Brexit. My dad always liked uh, reading history and biography. And one of the first of his books that I read was Elizabeth Longford's Born to Succeed, mm -hmm. Her Life of Queen Victoria. She did a wonderful job Magnificent. I think, describing, describing the whole age. Mm -hmm. She thought the relationship with uh, John Brown was chased, but I gather she still is she still around and you talk to her, I gather, because your narrative talks about her. Oh, yeah. My, How are I, the Longfords doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I didn't actually speak to her. Her daughter is, is, is quite prolific. Look, um, yes, new material has come, you know, has come out since she wrote that book. We do not know about the, what she was buried with. Um, so significant that that fragment of information still remains. Um, and she also said, look... Um, 
I know there's all this evidence. I know there's the you know the, these these the 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 letters, the way she felt about him, the way she spoke about him. Um, and she believed that as a widow, she never would have remarried. Um, but she said that no one ever stumbled in upon them or saw anything inappropriate or remiss. And I believe that James Reed did. Um, I believe we have more evidence than, than she actually um, than she had at the time. And I also think that, to be honest, we get quite distracted about what form the intimacy took. I think she was deeply in love with him. And I don't really think it, to some extent it matters. To me, that's the, the, the greater scandal. But she, would, she did speak about him differently to Albert. Albert, if you've been to Hyde Park, that's the Albert of her imagination, this gold-like god with muscular thighs surrounded by the virtues and the angels. She thought he was so superior and angelic and extraordinary. And John Brown was this strapping man that she drank whiskey with on the highlands who made her laugh, who protected her and was singularly devoted to her. So it was a different kind of, of, of love or a different kind of expression of it. So, yes. But a hats off to uh, Elizabeth Longford. She's she was a terrific... Oh, uh, no. Hi there. I'm curious about the process, and I'm wondering how long you researched, mm -hmm. and when did you know you were finished? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's so hard to finish. Yeah. It is so hard to finish. I don't, you, you never, you just, you just, it's almost, I, I can't even answer that part of it. Okay. Um, I'll try. But um, I researched for six years. Um, the best way to finish is to write because it's, it's, I kept going down all these really fascinating wormholes. Lord Melbourne's wife who used to dress in boys' clothing and, and snuck into the public gallery to watch his speech when women weren't allowed there, dressed as a page and who had an affair with Lord Byron and tried to cut her wrists at a ball and wrote, went off and wrote novels and she was scandalous and fascinating. Um, what was Victoria's fascination with what is, you know, it's called the freak shows of the time um, and the, the lion, the, fe the female lion tamer she took under her wing and her love of the elephants and her all those kinds of things. Mendelssohn's view. I was also tracking people throughout her time. I tried to parallel her life with well, what was Florence Nightingale doing? and what was Charles Dickens doing and Thomas Carlyle. P.T. Barnum. <laughs> yes, and they all, all right, and Tom Thumb, and I have a whole section on Tom Thumb, meeting her and performing for her. And, um, yeah, and what a sad life in many ways. But, um, or even getting lost in the newspaper accounts of the time because at the time, you know, we, Charles Dickens was writing and Trollope was writing and, and in, at a time when there was no television, there was a reporter on, you know, every corner writing in fantastic prose what they actually saw with this incredible amount of visual detail. So there just comes a point when you have to end, when you feel you've, you've told the story. But... Um, I love the research so much, it, like living in a parallel kind of planet that I just had to eventually pull up stumps. And you know what? That, and there's also a lot of extra things in footnotes as well. Um, it's kind of delicious, <laughs> that whole there. You're writing the history yeah. of a century um, and a city and, and the heart of a queen. Thank you. Well, it's been a beautiful evening hearing you. you speak of Victoria. I have this question that really comes up from the crown because I was astounded to watch this piece unveil the lack of her education or the inadequacy of her mm. education. And some of what you've spoken of tonight talks about, you know, how much there's an anticipation to just leave it to the ministers, leave it to those, your advisors, mm. to answer these questions. And Victoria was involved. So mm. did she have more education than what it seems Elizabeth had, the, our, the current Queen Elizabeth? Yes, and I was actually talking to Sally Bedell-Smith about that today, about I was trying to fact-check the crown with her. Yeah. Um, and there was no Mr. Hogg. Uh -huh. She did the not tutor. have a pro. She did not have a tutor. Uh -huh. 
Um, she had a generalist education until the point at which it became apparent she would be queen and then she did go down the road to Eton um, to receive an education. So, you know, obviously there were some concerns in that area mm-hmm. but not quite as depicted. Mm-hmm. Victoria had a... Um, Albert would always tell her that her education was inferior to his. Um, but she she spoke several languages fluently. She had a very strong governess who, again, is so interesting. Her name was Baroness Leitzen. And she was somewhat of a blue stocking who told her to be a strong and decisive queen. And that was that was what she was intent on making her. And, um, and who shielded her at the time that Victoria was being bullied by her mother and John Conroy and asked to... Um, asked to give up her power to them effectively. So she, and then Albert Albert got rid of Leitzen in you know and and told her to go and she packed up her bags in the thick of night. There just couldn't be the two of them in the house together. Too much power. Right. <laughs> um so but you know she did but she did um always struggle with did she know enough and mm. she was married to a man with a kind of ferocious intellect so um it was Lord Melbourne and uh, who tutored her in the ways of politics and entertained her, her first prime minister. Um, and she, you know, had an enormous crush on him as well, mm. um, but, in, but in a different kind of way. But we also have to remember that the then it was so – there, so, there were no women in public life. The expectation for what a, a woman appearing in public could do, let alone, you know, an 18-year-old woman – was so low that when she first spoke to her, the Privy Council, and Melbourne had written um, her speech. So she just read out a speech, right? But they were sobbing. There were men who left in tears, who were overcome. I mean, it was a very emotional and expressive time. There was a lot of weeping amongst politicians then. Um, but, yes, um, they were, they just, it was, it was like that Samuel Johnson thing. It's like saying a woman, seeing a woman preaching is like seeing a dog walk on its hind legs. It's just amazing to see it done at all. Uh, it was a little bit like that with Victoria, but she did struggle with her education and Albert took it upon himself to constantly improve her. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I liked your article in Time about Hillary Clinton's, like the feet. And let me elaborate a little more. How would Victoria advise Hillary Clinton to deal with like disappointment and like adversity? Mm. Can you collaborate a little more on that? I, mm. I really liked it. Um, well, what I was writing about in time, it was really that she endured and that that stamina and resilience, obviously, look, presidential campaigns are exacting and exhausting. Anyone from another country is like, what? <laughs> Seriously, like, what? And all those, feel like, you know, cheesesteaks and uh, for the cameras. And I mean, it, it's, it's, it's so gruelling. I wonder why they're put under such physical tests. But, um, yeah, but, but the, this, that's one form of stamina and another is simply to endure. And um, Victoria's resilience was extraordinary. She protested that she was not after, – after Albert died, she would often said, that I just, I'm just going to go and be with him. That's it. I'm done with it. Or, she'd say, or when she was fighting with her ministers, she'd say, I'm going to Australia, <laughs> the very bottom of the earth. And, um, and, you know, but she had this thirst for life that was, that was so strong that even when she was on her deathbed – um, and you have to remember that Albert, not long before he died, said, I really, I don't really have, I don't love life the way you do. He was melancholic. And he really basically said, if beset, I wouldn't struggle to live. And when, when um, Florence Nightingale saw him, she said, this is a man that looked like he was almost ready to die. Some unkind people have that attributed that to Victoria. Um, but, yes, yeah, so, so, but she, even on her deathbed, was asking her doctor to keep her alive because she had more to do. And I guess my, uh, when we think about, like, w- is there only one glass ceiling? Is there only one goal for women? I mean, what does endurance mean? What does stamina look like? And I, was, and, uh, I love Catlin Moran's writing as well, and she wrote this great piece about how when she heard that – I don't know if you know her, but she's that fantastic eccentric um, 
writer from from London, and she had said she'd always look forward to. She's she's always she said I've always looked forward to being an old hag. And when I get older, I'm just going to grow gar, you know, grow, um, you know, grow some herbs and retire and just kind of lecture young people. And she said that when she heard about Hillary's running for president, that it suddenly opened up to her this whole that 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 in her mind she'd thought about this kind of decline in those years. Not a stepping up, not a blooming, not an expansion. And that ir- irrespective of whether that's won or lost or whatever your view of Hillary Clinton, she endured and in a way redefined that th- that is a time that you can reach for, you know, as a woman, your prime in your 60s. She was going to be, you know, the leader of the free world in, in her 70s. And that in itself, I think, is really is significant. And so what Victoria, how, what the two of them would say together in a room, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but um, I like to think she'd invite her to Balmoral. They could have a bit of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about nasty men, I don't know. <laughs> Give us some tips. You said that Queen Victoria was very interested in or, or tolerant of other religions mm. and also that she was very committed to her empire. That yes. She, um, I wondered if oh. you could talk about the connection between those two and whether the one might have been the reason for the other or possibly the mm. two grew together. Mm. By saying that, I don't mean to gloss over the excesses of empire at the time. Not at all. Um, you know, by the end of her life, and she never t- was told, for example, about the concentration camps in the Boer War in South Africa that really set the template for con- the concentration camps for the century following that were set up by the British that were disgraceful. Um, she never learnt about those and she would have been completely horrified. She was a naturally, when it came to religion, she just had a natural tolerance. She wrote, about, she wrote up her sermons each week. She liked them short and direct. And she didn't like anyone to waffle on. She didn't like pomposity. She, she could, you know, she, she was not intimidated ever by bishops. Um, so I think that put her in, in, in kind of strong stead. Um, she appointed the first Jewish man to be mayor of London. She um, was, was often telling off the members of her household for what she saw as prejudice racism that they expressed towards her Indian servants. She was very attached to the Munshi, her Indian clerk, at the end of her life, who in some ways took took the place of a, of an, a, of a companion, but he's often likened to John Brown, but it's a completely different dynamic. But he was a social climber. He was very keen to not be considered staff, and he exaggerated his credentials and who his family was, and he wanted to be part of the household. And the household were horrified, including James Reed, by his bossing about of other Indians and other such things and his making up of things about his father. So, um, but Victoria defended him and um, and told them off. She or she couldn't understand why they were in the wars. There were Indians would not be fighting along. The British troops, you know, that to her was something that she addressed. And when when there were times of 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 brutality, and 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 I and I know that um, you know what some would call atrocities were committed in her name. When we look at the Indian Mutiny of 1857, but what she was most concerned with afterwards was do not punish those. It was so bloody and and awful and protracted, but do not punish those who dissented. Do not, because the British public was paying for blood. So, and then she also wrote a statement to say, I respect all religions, and, you know, and, um, and the Hindu and the Muslim and the Christian alike. And I think that was very um, forward looking for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Mm. Did you get a sense of um, what I'm getting at is domestic policy? in terms of uh, what was Victoria's attitude? I know she had a good relationship with Benjamin Disraeli, mm-hmm. but for example, on Irish home rule, mm-hmm. expansion of the franchise, mm-hmm. did, mm-hmm. did you She, a, yeah, no, of course. Um, they, were the, they were the great moral questions questions of her time. She did not support Gladstone in, in Irish home rule. And it's the thing that, that in hindsight, any historian would most admire about William Gladstone because he committed political suicide for being exactly right about Irish home rule. 
Um, and if only he'd been followed for that. I mean, their personal animosity was so intense. I don't know how much of it played how much of that played into that. Um, she said she was worried about how they would cope economically. She was worried about it being a slippery slope. She was she was a uh, – initially she was a Whig. She became a Tory, um, right? So um, early in her reign, um, particularly when it came to things like slavery, very concerned with the plight of the gypsies throughout Europe and those kinds of things. And she was concerned – with social conditions, but not in anywhere near the sense, say, Florence Nightingale, whose intellect was like tearing holes in, in the contemporary thinking about health, and Prince Albert, who created the Great Exhibition of 1851 and designed his own housing for the working poor. But she supported him in that. Um, so she, the suffrage she saw as inevitable, but to be taken cautiously, very, very slowly, um, any suggestion of the abolition of the House of Lords, she was certainly not in, in, in favour of. Um, I mean, many of those who were pro-suffrage were anti, anti-monarchy as well. But she did form a, a, a crucial role in the 1884 bill in, in getting the two parties to, to come together in the middle. And she's credited with, with, um, with getting that legislation through, with resigning herself to the fact that it was going to go through. Um, and she always really wanted a centre a centre place in British political life. And she was often trying to nudge people, partly to keep William Gladstone out of power. But, um, yeah, so, you know, quite conflicted. And she was the kind of person who, when confronted viscerally or visibly with a social concern, took it very much upon herself to try to do something about it. Thank you. One, one other question. Emperor Napoleon III, mm -hmm. did get any sense of what her relationship was like with him yes um yeah they they had quite a close relationship yeah, yeah. Okay. it fraught at times as well okay. um and and albert was a sorry of the unification of italy well she supported austria in its, tight, in its holding of Italian territory, so it wasn't entirely, not entirely in favour of it, but yes. So, thank you. Um, you've uh, obviously tried very hard and apparently succeeded in humanising <laughs> Victoria beyond what previous historians have been able to do um, and, dis and dispelling myths. And the myth of uh, Victoria as prudish Mm -hmm. uh, seems to be one of the ones that you've uh, worked especially hard to uh, to dispel. Well, it just and becomes apparent. Yes. Right. Right. You seem at one point you said that you thought that Albert probably played a big role in that myth and in, in um, furthering the mm -hmm. myth and so yes. forth. Is that mm -hmm. kind of the full story right there? And can you generalize that beyond to the whole? way we think of the Victorian era and Should speak be. now of the Victorian era? Uh, or were there other really important forces that uh, even beyond Albert uh, and other members of the family, like the church, mm -hmm. evangelicals mm -hmm. or whatever, that really wanted to um, kind of develop that whole idea about the queen? Mm. About her and Puritanism. Yeah. Um, it certainly came, it was very strongly a part of Albert's makeup. Um, his father ha had um, been a philanderer. His mother he had not seen since the age of five because she had begun a relationship of her own, allegedly. We, the timing is unclear. Um, and was kicked out of town. She was the scarlet woman. I mean, a, a theme of all of this Puritanism throughout the Victorian age is the shocking double standard. Um, the Contagious Diseases Act where any woman could be inspected on the street. On the street on the spot for having venereal disease. And that's what women like Josephine Butler were campaigning against. Um, so there absolutely were. Um, it, 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 you know, it it's, was a time of greater forces is what, is what I'm saying. It was a time of um, domesticity. It was a time where women were, were said to have the responsibility for sexual behaviour and sexual relations. And it really was about a constraint and control of, of female sexuality in large part. Uh, in the same room where at, at Osborne House, where that's, I, I'm not sure if you two remember this, but this that, that, that painting that I was talking about before, there is a billiard table designed by 
a pool table designed by Albert. And it's quite high. Can you remember that? And it's so the women don't lean over and show their cleavage. So they kind of just stand here and play like that instead. So, um, and he was he um, was the one who really argued that ministers who had some kind of compromising sexual behaviour or um, they shouldn't be shouldn't be part of cabinet. And Victoria did at times take that up as well, um, and 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 successfully kept people out of out of cabinet which is not to say that she was like a as um one man called her a little vixen she wasn't a rampaging um you know sexual liberationist she was very much of her time but there's evidence um that she was uh, definitely not definitely not um as constrained as, as albert was or as intent as albert was on insisting that that was the way to behave because it would preserve relations in a way that he had wanted his mother's to be. I mean, he and his brother, his family, his mother was buried in her, um, in France with where, where she'd been with her lover. And he ended up interring the body and putting it back with the father to make sure that in death, you know, the bodies could be there together. Um, I've zoomed in and out during that whole answer, but there's, but in terms of the broader f terms of reference, there's, right. there's a lot of interesting forces at sway. Thank you. Thanks. Who were the four people that did not become king or queen that meant left made room for her to become queen? Oh right, yeah. I um, it's a completely fascinating story. The and to understand Victoria, you, you do need to understand the generation before her. So we had George the Third, who was a good queen, a good king. <laughs> um, <laughs> Apart from the whole, you know, America thing. Um, <laughs> bit careless. Um, or great. Anyway, that's another matter entirely. But he, you know, he was upright. He, he's the one that brought in the Royal Marriages Act that's caused such consternation in the, over the last century in the monarchy, which means that the monarch needs to approve of the people that you um, marry. Now, his sons took that very well in some ways and had all these relations with women that they said, I'm really sorry, I'd love to marry you, but dad won't let me. Um, now, he um, did go on to be, you know, he did become mad as now has been famously recorded. Um, and in his decline, his eldest son became regent. His eldest son had a daughter, Charlotte. Now, of all of King George III's grandchildren, she was the only legitimate. There were 63 illegitimate children. <laughs> so all the hopes rested on Charlotte. And she married this dashing uncle, Victoria's uncle, Leopold from Coburg. Um, and unfortunately, Due to the great wisdom or otherwise of the doctors at the time when she was pregnant, she, um, she put on weight, complained about it. I don't know if it was preeclampsia or something. They put her on a diet and they put leeches all over her. She died giving birth and so did the child. So um, it, England went into mourning because here was this hope. And suddenly the other of George's sons kind of you know, groom themselves, comb their hair, headed off to the royal courts of Europe. Um, they've, of course, been fighting with France for a long time, so they wanted usually a good German princess. And they all began racing, and suddenly children were born one after the other. And Victoria was the next in line to the throne. Um, and that's how all of that happened. She kind of came out of a weird period of licentiousness and depravity and and was this really upright creature and, and her... She was said to be such a robust child. She was called a pocket Hercules, but her own father, her own father died when she was only a few months old. One of the great stories of of her life. 